o strategii Unii Europejskiej 2020 dla rynku płatności będzie rozmawiał ze swoimi gośćmi dr Krzysztof Korus, founding partner DLK Legal. Zapraszam pana Krzysztofa. Pan Krzysztof jest z nami na scenie tutaj fizycznie, a jego goście y, dwóch y, prelegentów będzie online. Scena jest pana. Dzień dobry, witam serdecznie państwa. Szybciutki przegląd techniki. Pamiętam, że mieliśmy mieć jeszcze jedną osobę tutaj na scenie z nami. Pan dyrektor Gałązka jest z nami. Okej. Okay. Katarzyna Nick. Good, good morning, still good morning. Hi. Good morning. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry państwu. Nick, can you hear us? You, you have to unmute, Nick. Yes, I was on mute all the time. Apologies. Good morning. Okay, so thank you very much. So once again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It must, it's my pleasure to host uh, the uh, excellent panel of experts in payments market, not only from the Polish perspective, but also from the European one. Thank you for introduction. I'm Christopher Kodos. I'm founding partner and CEO of DLK. Legal, I'm personally heavily involved in the European developments of uh, payment strategies and legislation. I have the pleasure to work on a daily basis with, with Nick, who is, uh, who is the CEO of Afor Consulting. Uh, the panelists are Katarzyna Hiliad Koblińska, policy officer from DigiFisma from European Commission. Good morning, Katarzyna. Good Thank morning. you for accepting an invitation. Then we have Nick, CEO of Afor Consulting, heavily involved in any matter relating to modern legislation of, and regulation of financial services. Hi, Nick. Hi there. And, and, and finally, we have Piotr Gawonska, who is the director of the Polish Permanent Representation of uh, Polish Banking Association in Brussels. And uh, immediately, because the time is very uh, constrained today, we have only 30 minutes, let me uh, jump quickly to the, uh, to the structure of the panel for today. And what I would like to touch upon is three uh, key essential matters. It is strategy. So first, the very strategical issues we have on the table. Then the harmonization, which is always key for any development in the EU. And then, Finally, something which is key for any area of the, today's world, which is tech, tech for pay in this case. And uh, starting from Katarzyna, who is responsible for driving our uh, policies, I mean the policies that have direct impact on us. So Katarzyna, uh, from your perspective, uh, what would you describe as most prominent market failures currently on the uh, payments market, which uh, requires your attention and perhaps your action? Just to remind you that we have only, that we have in principle three rounds of questions, so please keep it as short as possible in order to cover all we have planned. So Katarzyna, mic is yours. Thank you very much. I'll try to be concise as, as much as I can. Um, so I think the starting point for looking at the failures would be to look at the uh, retail payment strategy that was published by the European Commission last year. Uh, and you will see that the vision that we outlined for the European retail payments is to have uh, citizens and businesses in Europe to benefit from uh, a broad range of diverse, uh, high-quality payment solutions. I was listening to the previous panel with interest about, you know, the cash versus no cash and digital versus non-digital. Uh, for the European Commission, uh, the objective is to have indeed the variety, the choice uh, of uh, instruments which are innovative and competitive and safe and efficient and, 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 and really attractive for the users. And so what we also want to see more in the EU is to have competitive homegrown, so European uh, payment solutions. We have quite a lot of them, but we would like them to be pan-European. So not really limited to the uh, domestic markets, but really to have them pan-European. Um, and finally, to really go outside of the Europe and really be the leader in the world in the global payments and really improve the cross-border payments also with non-EU jurisdictions. So now that you know, I recall this, these objectives, 
I will go very quickly through, let's say, the issues that uh, you know we look at as European Commission. So one of the things definitely is fragmentation. We mentioned some successful payment solutions exist in many countries. In Poland, it's bleak. Unfortunately, there is not one cross-border payment solution. I mean, a, a Polish user using Bleak, as soon as they cross the border within the internal market, the only solution that they have other than cash to pay abroad is using uh, you know, cards to basically provided by two providers. This is quite limited. So we want to really tackle that fragmentation and really create a, the same pan-European experience, which should be the case for the users in Europe. Um, then, of course, you know, the question is, are we reaping the full benefits of the PSD2, of the Payment Services Directive? Probably there's still quite a lot of untapped potential. Um, I think some of it is down to the fact that the focus is very much on compliance and not so much about, you know, innovation and really tapping the benefits of it. You, if you look at a strong customer authentication, the question is, you know, it, are, are we really you know, achieving what we wanted to achieve, or are we helping international players, uh, you know, the, the, the various <laughs> X pace uh, providers that are available in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, the same with open banking. Uh, I think the fact that there's no standardized APIs, we really have to rethink, was the construction really the right one? Uh, you know, where we expected that banks would happily finance their competitors' access to data. Um, there's very little competition in the area of acquiring, which is very much impacting the merchants. Uh, we also see quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, problems with uh, the impacts of the providers of technical solutions within the value chain, whether it is, you know, access to certain infrastructures like the NFC antenna, or whether it is, uh, you know, to do with creating such large IT providers that the entire value chain then relies upon and they are too big not to fail. Uh, so I'll stop here because you asked me to be brief and we could go on for probably much longer, but I'll, 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 I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for keeping uh, the time. Uh, so if I understood you correctly, the, your main concern from the EU perspective is that uh, we have two, uh, to a small number of pan-European payment methods. So uh, actually, so you consider that the availability of cards from international players is not uh, sufficient and we all have to work to, uh, to work out pan-European so that in short, BLIC becomes one day pan-European. Peter, uh, now the question to you. So uh, out of, now, now the European payment strategy is almost nine months old. So we had enough time to, to go through it, to detect what is most cumbersome, most painful, and what is most promising. So from the perspective of banking society, what banking industry is Poland, is there something which is most prominent and most cumbersome? Uh, thanks, Krzysztof. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here after this long time of not being anywhere. Um, uh, regarding the strategies uh, proposed in, uh, in September, uh, I would say there are a couple of things which should be noted. First of all, I want to say that the legislative proposal of DORA, of Digital uh, Operational Resilience Act regulation, is uh, something which should be very much applauded because it shows and underlines the need and the necessity to protect the resilience of the sector against cyber threats. And I think that it's important to show that cyber threats in a current uh, modern uh, digital world is not only a way to achieve other purposes, but is a purpose itself. So uh, uh, it could bring a lot of uh, legal certainty, uh, certainty regarding compliance, because it puts uh, cybersecurity on the same level with uh, data protection, accounting, all kind of uh, stuff related to uh, to compliance uh, issues. Uh, regarding stuff which might be difficult and costly, I can say that the most costly regulations are those which are not proportionate. So when I look into the retail uh, payment strategy, I don't see very risky stuff there, but uh, the question is how it's going to be executed uh, afterwards in the execution of the strategy. And I think that there are two issues which might be 
might be difficult. First of all, is the assessment of fees regarding instant payments. In the retail strategy, we can find uh, we can find a, a quote saying that the Commission will analyze the idea of capping the fees on instant payments and uh, equaling them uh, or leveling off them with the fees on, uh, let's say, uh, traditional um, uh, credit transfers. And of course, uh, it's an idea worth analyzing, but at the same time, we need to remember that there is a huge difference in the quality for the consumer. So if there is a difference in quality, then they should be at least taken into consideration that something might be a bit more expensive. And the second issue, which is uh, might be burdensome and it should be analyzed profoundly, and I think it's linked with the discussion we had in the previous panel about the cash, it's the ac acceptance and availability of cash. So this requires really a, a level of proportionality because, let's be honest, uh, cash management is expensive and uh, it, we have to clearly analyze the cost versus profits. Uh, but at the same time, we can ask the question, why cash is uh, so uh, underlined and you know highlighted in this strategy when we are trying to develop here some good solutions for uh, cashless solutions in payment markets so perhaps uh, that this lack of trust uh, in in cashless solutions is still an important factor slowing down the development and i think that this uh, lack of trust is something which has to be tackled as well uh, uh, with uh, the issue of uh, security. Thank you. So I, I'm surprised to see that the banking industry considers the DORA proposal a sort of benefit and uh, uncertainty that, that brings benefit. That is something I will definitely remember. I have one additional question in, in the retail payment strategy just after the statement that perhaps the, uh, the, the fees should be capped. There is another game changer that perhaps chargebacks should be obligatory vis-a-vis -vis instant payments in order they can, they can really compete with card payments. Do you have any stay, state on this? Do you have any opinion uh, whether it's feasible or you actually fight it? Well, it is feasible. The question is uh, how it's going to be uh, regulated because I'm, I'm, I'm supporting any ideas which are bottom up, so the idea is coming from the market. And I I'm, I'm really believe that regulating it very strictly on the European level, like a solution that one fits all, might not be a good idea here. Okay. Nick, now the question to you, which should be much hotter, because the uh, non-bank sector is considered as the main competitive driver from the financial industry. And actually, most of what we do in the legislation, in strategies, in soft law, is to the benefit of the non-bank sector. What do you think most empowering in the retail payment strategy or retail market strategy, if comes into life? You have to unmute Nick once again, Nick. No, I'm not on mute. Uh, now it works. Um, it's, it's fine. It's fine now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. So apologies, I wasn't on mute. Um, so uh, it's interesting because uh, some time ago I spoke to Walter Stamprovskis, the then commissioner, about this, and he made a very interesting point. That he said, to develop a roadmap, you need to know where you want to build the road to. So what is actually the objective you want to achieve? And I think Katarina started to look at that. But I do miss still a little bit of vision of where we actually want to be in 2025 or 2030. What are we trying to build with this roadmap and where is this roadmap going? But if you take it beyond that, specifically to the non-bank sector, I think it, you're absolutely right, Christoph. This is a, a roadmap that very much recognizes the emergence and importance of this sector. And actually looking at all of the actions, you know, all of them are relevant in one form or another. But if I pick out just a few, I think Katarzyna raised the Payment Services Directive and the revision, possible revision of the Payment Services Directive. Now, we're not looking forward to having a PSD3. But there are areas where I think a further consideration is needed. One example is around strong customer authentication. We worked really hard, Christoph, as you know, on getting transaction risk analysis built into this. The ability of individual companies to assess their own risk profile and communicate that through the payment chain and thereby do away with uh, strong customer authentication. Really, that hasn't been implemented. It's not been really considered in the chain, and it's not something that 
many parties in the chain would be comfortable with at the moment. I think that's a lost opportunity. And the other one is around API, so open access issues. I think the, the roadmap goes broader in talking about the future of open finance, open payments. It's not really happened under the PSD to the extent that we wanted to. I'm not criticizing the banking sector. I think there's been a lot of uncertainty as to the standards and the comparability and the commission and DEBA have tried to do their best to kind of bring everybody together, but it hasn't operationally worked. And now we're thinking about extending that from the PSD into other sectors, which actually I think is a really good idea to increase competition. But the question then is, what can we learn from the PSD? What can we take from the PSD? Do we build on the PSD and reform it? Or do we throw, it, throw that particular provision to the side and, and start it fresh? I think that's really, really key. But I think two or three other things I would just like to mention. We just talked about instant payments. To make this work for the non-bank sector, we need to amend a piece of legislation that goes back to 2001, 2002, the so-called settlement finality directive. That's also in the roadmap. It's been dealt with by Katagina's colleagues, you know, in DG Just maybe. We have to work out on the post date space, we have to work out how this will work. But the challenge really here is that unless non-bank institutions can provide settlement finality, legal certainty in their transactions, and don't have to go through the banks, we can't be part of the intra-bank payment system. And that means we can't be part of the digital euro, we can't be part of TIPS, the settlement system that drives instant payment. And that means we're always dependent on banks as our intermediaries. And while we like banks, we should be put on equal footing. And maybe the last one, because I'm conscious of time, just to give you a sense, is really around the question of e-identification. We're really, really excited about the proposal that came out uh, on this literally last week. Uh, and I think for us, it's really only the first step, because unless we can have online identification, online KYC, online customer KYC, so know your customer identification, really what happens is that the online environment is still perceived to be more risky, even though I think the, the technology is much more advanced than photocopies of, of little ID cards. But in any case, it seems to be more risky because it's not face to face. We really need to overcome that because this is, I think, become one of the biggest barriers to cost for the development of all the payment providers that uh, Katarina was just talking. Thank you, Nick. You have mentioned uh, quite important stuff, specifically from the non-bank industry, which, who, which is the main driver, specifically open finance. Katarzyna, one uh, incidental question to you. So my feeling is that uh, in the retail strategies, it was rather prominent topic, but in the past nine months, you were rather silent on this. So we've seen a lot of developments on the other stuff, but not too much. We've even seen in the Digital Markets Act the coverage of the NFC issue, but we can't see much regarding open finance. Can you quickly comment what, what shall we expect regarding open finance? Have you lost your, uh, your belief in open finance? Um, I will start rather <laughs> bluntly answering. I think when we're talking about open finance, it's not really a question about payments. Uh, of course, the first time this was introduced was in PSD2. Uh, we are, uh, you know, in the process of, of really lesson learning. Uh, and, and these experiences that we have in the payments area is, of course, something that will be very valuable for our colleagues who will work on open finance. But we have to remember that open finance is, is something, you know, much broader. I mean, will it be open banking? Will it be open finance? Will it be open data? Uh, I, I, you know, the, 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 the reflection on this is still ongoing, but I'm afraid this is not something that is, you know, a payment related topic. This is not going to be a payments uh, initiative. So, so I'm afraid you will have to uh, be a little bit patient uh, on this one. I, I know colleagues are working on this, but it's, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of the European Commission vision for, for payments as such, is, 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 I'm afraid it's, it's kind of, you know, left this uh, starting point and it's, it's now has a life on its own. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the question was uh, was based upon the the, the state the, the the fact that uh, this is the area which can learn from the developments in open banking. We really had hard lessons, so it would be not wise to uh, to lose it, not to discount it. So, Nick, coming back to the harmonization level, I would have another question to you, and then to Peter. So, uh, this is this, uh, these are short questions. In Dora and Mecca, we have seen, we, we see something we have seen already in crowdfunding. So the attempt for harmonization by securing pan-European supervision of providers. In crowdfunding, finally it failed. So again, back, we are in the supervision by national competition, competent authorities. Dora and Mika still assume that over a certain level, the supervision is by European authorities. Do you believe just short answer. It remains that, like in the rating agencies, we will have the very first example of direct supervision of providers by the pan-European authorities. Well, if I make it very short, is Andorra, it's, it's oversight, not supervision. So that's, that's a blurring of the line. One has to be careful, but there will be some form of an oversight framework. And by the way, we agree that Dora is a very important file but there needs to be full complementarity and alignment with the PSD incident reporting requirements. We can't have different regimes for different uh, use cases. So, but come back to your point on Mika, you know, it's one of the most hottest contested issues and it will be discussed by finance ministers in two weeks or less than two weeks. So maybe you should ask them. But if I had to take my crystal ball out, yes, I think for the largest stable coin providers, if we ever see any of them in Europe after what's happening, they would be under direct supervision. And that might be under the EBA, that might be under IOPA, that might be under, and interestingly enough, potentially IOPA, or it might be under the ECB, I don't know. That's uh, above my pay grade, but there will be some form of direct over supervision of stable coins, if they stable mm -hmm. coins. If they ever, which means that you believe that the, the legislation will be in place, but not necessarily the providers will be above the levels qualifying for the European supervision. Very no, informative. No, 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 Peter, sorry. now... No, no, just to say, I think many providers will be over the thresholds potentially, just whether Europe is attractive enough for the providers to actually base themselves in Europe, because actually the rules are quite prohibitive. Okay, thank you. Peter, another short question to you. The, one of the uh, ever purposes, so everlasting purposes of European policies is harmonization. Uh, we don't see it that much in Europe. Poland, Poland is quite homogenous market. We don't have that much champions providing services outside of Poland. Is harmonization or lack of harmonization a threat, an opportunity? How do you perceive it in your daily business and daily work? Well, the current situation where we have a fragmentation in terms of prudential regulations, where banks are the most stringently supervised entities, obviously is not um, a good situation for banks. So we would be looking for some more leveling off regarding supervision. And that is why one of the initiatives of the European Commission announced in uh, uh, in the strategies, meaning uh, coming back to the idea of same risk, same activity, same rules is something which we are looking forward to. Uh, I know we know that the Commission has sent a call for for advice to ESAs, to EBASMA and IOPA to ask how to address this issue, how to tackle the most important stuff like uh, consumer protection um, uh, funds. Um, or deposit guarantees, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I think this is very important. And at the same time, if we are talking about fragmentation, it's worth mentioning that uh, it's a bit disappointing that in the retail uh, payment uh, strategy, there is only about euro, there's nothing about other currencies. Obviously, I clearly understand that euro is a common currency of the European Union and the European Commission has to uh, take it as a, um, as a blueprint, as a starting point when in discussing anything regarding payments. But I think that payments is mean to um, really establish a common market for all the member states, not only member states of the Euro of Eurozone. And I think we need to look into that, that European Union is not Eurozone. European Union is about single market. Indeed, very, very, very important statement. So I understand it that you are not so much concerned about the uh, 
absent harmonization of prudential requirements, but of private and uh, relations with, with, with end users. Okay, uh, Katrina, uh, last round of questions coming back to you again. IT and tech providers it is the hottest and, uh, slogan and both uh, dilemmas as well. So what is the long-term outlook for IT providers for financial services? So or even farther than Dora says also, do you, in your like small talks in the corridors of the European buildings, do you, uh, do you talk from time to time, one day they have to be regulated like financial institutions? Is it this way or you don't go this way? Well, uh, let me just <laughs> first to say that uh, there's not many talks in the European corridors going on nowadays. As you can see, we are still in our houses. So uh, unfortunately, hopefully that will <laughs> return very soon. Um, I, I just wanted to make a very sh short remark to what Piotr uh, just said about uh, the, the focus on the Eurozone. I think this is very important. Um, I can assure you that for the European Commission, the focus when we talk about, you know, especially removing this fragmentation and really ensuring the uh, one single market and the single uniform experience so that the European citizens, whether they're coming from the Eurozone or outside of the Eurozone, and I come personally from outside of the Eurozone, of course, I come from Poland. So uh, the, the, really the objective for us is that the consumer has a, and a user and also the merchants have really this uniform European experience. Um, however, I have to say that, you know, when the, the, the European Commission is not the only one in the equation. You have to remember that in order for the European Commission to adopt any uh, solution, we have to have cooperation also of the member states. And I think there's a lot of resistance. I'm not really in the blame game, but just to really understand, for, for you to understand the context. There's a lot of resistance, you know, not only from the, the authorities, but also from the industry from outside of the Eurozone to really go ahead saying, oh, but, you know, we are outside of the Euro, so we should not really focus on these solutions. You know, uh, give us two stage, three stage, four stage, uh, you know, uh, approach. Uh, so really this, I, I have to really insist that this, 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 this division is not really coming, you know, from, uh, from, 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 from us. We would definitely, you know, we are in the business of creating single markets throughout. Um, on the IT uh, providers, of course, I mean, they're very, very, um, you know, becoming more and more important in payments. I mean, they've always been there. Of course, there's no payments, you know, without IT, but they definitely moved from you know, back end solutions, or by, you're kind of dealing, you know, with the, with, the, with the back office stuff to and infrastructures to really, you know, front end. I mean, many consumers, when they use payments, they actually have no idea what the underlying payment service is. All they know is this kind of a overlay front end you know solution that the the IT providers are offering them and they have no idea what's happening you know behind well why should they I mean why should they be interested but of course this overlap well over reliance reliance increased reliance on IT uh, providers can re create risks of course yes we have Dora but this is you know only one piece of the puzzle um, so we have to be read on one hand to ensure that this does not create excessive risks, uh, also that it doesn't, you know, um, limit competition. But at the same time, we have to be uh, sure that whatever we do, we don't stifle innovation. Uh, so it's a very difficult balancing act. Uh, as the first step, uh, again, it's in the retail payment strategy, we announced that we would look at the technical service providers and the, the extent of the exclusions from the PSD2 and then this kind of uh, European legislation on, on payments and see if, you know, maybe some of them should really be considered as, 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 as providing uh, services that should be covered by the payments legislation. Uh, and that would be our first step, of course, and, and I think this will be reflected then in, in our thinking. Okay, we have uh, time for last question. Nick, <clears throat> I would use the time to ask you the question again regarding Mecca. Uh, we have worked a lot on identifying the position and the relation among various stakeholders, uh, specifically between payment services providers, so the intermediaries of transaction, in transactions and issuers of funds that are subject of the, the, a subject of the transactions. How do you assess the current setup of Mecca? Is it, is it as it should be, or it is a major failure? I wouldn't say major failure, but, but I think this is the one area where 
the EU legislative process has certain faults and that it often drives to quick decision making. And I think to some extent we're being rushed a little bit uh, to, to encourage, you know, success for the Portuguese presidency, which has been working incredibly hard. But I do think this particular point you raised, Christoph, has not been rightly calibrated in Mika because we have effectively two very distinct type of services in Mika. The issuance of stable coins or crypto assets. And the issuer has a certain number of responsibilities. And if I look at the stable coin issuer, they have to ensure the stabilization mechanism is in place, that you can redeem it, convert it back, so to speak, uh, that you kind of make a technology acceptable on whatever platform you want to use it. At the moment, it's DLT. So there are specific obligations that rest with the issuer or offerer. It's also unhelpful that we have two terms describing the same thing. But then you come into a different universe, which is the service providers. And the service providers might provide payments or other services. We just look at payments. And those two universes in our mind should not be mixed. Why? Because Mika needs to be technology neutral. And as Peter said, same risk, same regulation, same uh, requirements. The risks are different, the business is different in these two different things. And also when we move maybe to central bank issued uh, you know, digital euros, we want to make sure that a payment service provider is still providing a payment service and just because the digital euro doesn't move them into Mika or whatever else. You know, supervisors in 27 member states can take very interesting views on this going forward. So we want a very clear delineation. And what that means is, I don't want to go into too much detail, but what that really means is at the moment the legislation blurs the line between an e-money license and an issuing license for a stable coin. And they say actually you could do maybe do both with an e-money license. Now that's nice if you're an e-money issuer and you want to maybe do that, but in the medium term it creates all these unintended consequences of how these pieces of legislation interact and when Katagina has to look with great enthusiasm at the possible revision of the money directive next year, people will say, well, if you do all these other things in issuing stable coins, then we have to impose all kinds of new requirements on you. So there will be a knock-on effect on the traditional e-money industry. So just to put it very simply, if you provide a payment service in a stable coin, for us, it makes no difference whether it's a stable coin, whether it's a euro, whether it's a slotty, whether it's US dollar, it makes no difference, or digital euro or whatever. The service is the same, the risks, the responsibilities are the same. What's new is the issue, and for us that's a unique new service of somebody who sits between the banking sector or the central bank on the one hand and the universe of providers on the other hand, and creates the possibility ecosystem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was the super fast overview of the real payment strategies in 30 minutes after nine months. So I think we have uh, touched upon the, the hottest stuff, uh, out of which definitely I'm sure uh, for at least part of the European uh, services, the pan-European blick is the top priority because it is something that every end user feels or has not access to. And on the on the other side, we have uh, the very hot topic of uh, Mika crypto asset stable coins, and this is particularly something we need to hear in Poland uh, look at because my feeling is that we are uh, not sufficiently interested in those developments that while they may approach us much quicker than we approach them. So thank you very much, the panelists, for contributing, and uh, wish you productive uh, conference after this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you Thanks, very much. Professor.